Grace Carl Convention. And Mr. Emiliano Santa Lucia. Taylors there are in these in the states. Somebody, uh, uh, about a million. Oh. <laughs> and most of them are in jail. So. <laughs> and while he's getting ready here, yeah, before I start and we get all into specifics, anybody have anything they want to ask, comment? Anything they they want to make a statement? They anything at all? Otherwise, I'll just get into it and you know I can talk forever. <laughs> they're shyer than the U.S. fans. They have less place. But in the U.S. I have to fight for time, you know. <laughs> uh, somebody asked me a question about, uh, I know this will be sensitive to a lot of you, but I don't think it should be, uh, that on He-Man's chest, on this so-called armor, his, you know, that strap thing he's got, they asked me if that was an iron cross on there. And I said, yeah, it was. And this person said, why, what does that mean? I said, I like it, it's a great graphic. It's like the, uh, it's like the yin yang that the Korean Jews for their, their symbol. It's a beautiful symbol with positive and negative working, and it's just great. And um, why wouldn't I use it? He's a Gothic character, that's a Gothic symbol, goes clear back to the days of the Knights of the Iron Cross. Does anybody know who they were? Yeah. The Knights of the Iron Cross, anybody? Oh man, there's some of my heroes. I mean, they held the line of castles. Of course, they were kind of tough on the people that lived with them, but they held the line against all the guys that would come in from the steppes, all the barbarians that would come in to just kill everybody because they were hungry. And they would come in, and the only thing that stood between them and Europe for probably six, seven hundred years was this group of Gothic knights called the Knights of the Iron Cross. And they became, some of them became various, you know, the Knights Templar, the, uh, all these kinds of things, they broke up into these groups. But for a while, they were just these guys that just, they just said basically to the Mongols and the, uh, all the, the Tartars and people like that, they just said, now you're not going to cross my turf and we're going to stop you. And they, they, of course, played hardball. They said, well, we'll kill you if you try to stop us. And they basically went at it for all those years. So as a kid, when I read about these guys, I went, that's the kind of guy I want to be. I mean, I want to be that guy that no matter what, you don't cross over here. And He-Man, of course, represented that. So I wanted to use it, and I put it on there. And of course, many people said, you know, gee, is that the Iron Cross on there? And I said, you bet, why not? And um, I don't care. And it shows you how sometimes the smallest thing can create a whole bunch of controversy. And to me, as a designer, it's just, just a nice graphic. And that's all there is to it. And uh, oh, and it also represents bravery. You know, it, 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 it symbolizes somebody that just says, "No, nah, you know, it's not going to happen." Uh, my question is this: It always comes down to this in in uh, heroes, and everybody has to answer this inside themselves. Is there anything worth dying for? Is there anything, or do we just survive at all costs? I don't know the answer to it. I, I, I don't imagine it matters a whole lot, but to a hero, that's the very essence of what being a hero is. Are you willing to put it all on the line? Because you know the bad guy's going to, right? You, you get what I mean? I mean, you put it on the line, your opponent, you have to bet or believe he's going to put it all on the line. And I used to say when I'd start any male action line or even any action line whatsoever, even Hot Wheels, how do they fight? In the end, how do they fight? In other words, do they fight with magic spells and secret kind of uh, force fields, or do they fight hand to hand? I always found it interesting that in Star Wars, when it came down to it, they fought with swords. Well, they may be lightsabers, a big deal, but they were swords. I mean, how'd you kill a guy with a lightsaber? You cut him in half, right? So it's basically a sword. Just a really neat one that glowed in the dark, so you know, and it was very sharp. But that's pretty close. Why did the why, why did they 
if they're so sophisticated, they've got all these, all these things, why did they use a lightsaber at all? Why not just pull out a ray gun like the guy did with General Grievous? Why not just pull out a ray gun and blast him? Yeah. Well, because it's not, it's not about heroes then. It's, you know, you might as well have a drone and go over and have a, have a computer kill him by a distance. No, it's when you gamble your own life and he's gambling his or hers, then it's all on the table, isn't it? It's the biggest poker game you can play. Have I talked in a circle or? No. <laughs> okay. I'll let Emiliano take over now. But that I wanted to answer that because it was asked sincerely by somebody. And I always love a good graphic. And uh, that was, to me, a, a, a good graphic. And it symbolized something, so it made it even better. When I was at Art Center, I designed the logo for Art Center. And I designed it as a big red ball in a square. And later on, I caught lots of flack for that. And people said, why did you do it that way? And I said, because it's a great graphic. What can I say? I mean, if that doesn't get your eye, nothing will. And um, that's why I did it. Sir? Well, um, there is some weird stuff at the beginning of this. Um, it was meant to show what you were doing before he man Yeah. And how research for a new line worked when a, a toy company, you do concept exploration to see what kids may be interested in, and you explore different way, different concept and themes, and uh, and you try to find something interesting to create a new brand, a new property. And some of this stuff is things that Mark was working on before Ina, right before Ina, around the end of seventies. Mark, you go from there. I'll, I'll scroll. Please. It's true. <laughs> it's a little it's a little embarrassing to look at now because you know it's been a long time. But uh, I love dogs, and I mean, I love them. You know, dogs are, I'm not sure that dogs aren't as superior to us, really. So I love dogs, and, uh, I, and I admire the Indians very much. They're close to nature, but more than that, like the Knights of the Iron Cross, they were just doing the best they could, but they never chickened out. I mean, you, I don't know if you know anything about American history, but when they kicked Custer's ass at the little bighorn, they did it face on. They just went up there and said, no, you're not coming down here, you're not going to hurt us. They took him out and all his men out. So to me, that's not a, that's not as much of a slaughter as a battle. And this time, the cavalry lost. Of course, we turned them into heroes later on, but that's the way it works. When it gets to call the shots. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, this was, they, at that time, Mattel was very anxious to do something, <laughs> it's pretty funny actually, to do something that would uh, be big gym size, that would um, basically do military. Why? Why were we doing military? Because G.I. Joe was kicking our butt when Star Wars wasn't. So this was an attempt for Mattel to go after G.I. Joe, and you can see kind of how we did it. Uh, at that time we were getting our butt kicked in Vietnam, so this was kind of as soft as I could go and still do it so kids would be interested. <laughs> Anybody want to ask a question about that? Oh, yeah, if I had a question, just was it a uh, concept of what, or was like disguised? Yeah. Even, and then underneath, kind of? Yeah, and I mean, most of the disguises I would do, I would try to stay away from soft goods. Because soft goods, as my wife can tell you, it's, you have to get people to go buying stuff in China and sourcing it is such a problem. So, so soft goods are tough. Most of the stuff I liked at that time would be clip-on stuff. Much later, Polly Pockets did a great job with magnets. A friend of mine did it, but it turned out it hurt kids in the long run. But it didn't matter. At this time, I would prefer to try to do things with plastic if I could, and try to make, so I could put the, the folds in it and accent the body with the way it would drape. Um, probably, uh, I was a little bit, negligent in not doing more soft, soft goods stuff. But I gotta tell you, the people that controlled the soft goods, they just made it so hard for you to design. You'd have to wait till they found the material, the material would hang right. I've worked in Barbie long enough to know how really tough that could be. And my wife had told me how tough it is to get patterns that are appropriate to the figure. You know, if you've got a little figure like this, you can't have a big pattern that 
when you look at it, you're going to see like one twentieth of the pattern. You've got to have something that repeats on a small scale. You go on and on with it. After a while, you just say, you know what, soft goods are just a pain in the neck. But they are nice when they work. What do you think? <laughs> okay, this guy, anybody not understand this one? <laughs> there are techniques you were talking about. All those parts uh, in the legs are done with clips. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it's pretty upfront. This is one of my favorite because it's like a military guy mix it with that football play. We had gone into Iraq or Afghanistan at that time, so I didn't know anything about the fact that eventually uh, the, the horror of a, of a blocking bomb would be what they are, you know. Uh, I thought it would just be interesting if this guy uh, carried a, 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 a bomb on his chest. That of course was a shape chart, so it would blow up. That's and uh, that's it. You know, I mean, you can see how it was supposed to flip open here. And I had this dream that there'd be a spring-loaded piece inside. I might as well have made it come out and say "bang." You know, I don't know. You know, I mean, it, uh, it was fun to do. Um, yeah, there might be. Okay, this is Jack Gallagher. Which uh, I really don't know much about, but I found it in your book. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Uh, um, this one, see, I, I, the origin story of He-Man wasn't like the comic book or the movie shows it. The origin story I wanted was a lot more complex. And this is one of the, although, you know, it wasn't really complex, it was actually simpler. But they wanted to do it their own. At that, at that by the time, he-Man got going. So many people were working on it at the same time. You know, I hear people claim they did stuff, which they did, but it didn't have anything to do with me. Like Luke Scheimer did his stuff. The the people at uh, the comic book little, you know, the little comic book, they did their stuff, which you know. But there was very little control because they would come and lay the flats on my desk. You know, the uh, the uh, sketches. And they would lay it on my desk. I'd be doing the packaging here. I'd be doing the product over here. Ted is now working on the vehicles over here. And I'd look at it and I'd say, what do you want me to do with it? And they would say, basically this. They would say, just sign it off. And I would say, but I'd like to read it first. So I'd try to be reading it. And finally they'd say, just sign it off. And the truth is, I would just sign it off. Because I wanted the thing to get going. And in my mind, and this shows you how you can become very narrow. In my mind, the most important thing was product and packaging. If I could own that, and the TV commercial. Can't tell you how important the TV commercial was. In those days, without a great TV commercial, you had nothing. Nothing. And uh, Castle Grayskull actually was done mainly because of the TV commercial. The due date for sure was because of the TV commercial. But it was supposed to be the hero of the TV commercial, make the line look like it was huge. And so, um, that was the big star. Uh, this this guy was the necromancer. He was going to be part of the bad side, part of the bad side, the real guy behind the power. But all those appeared to be um, another line that probably was when Roger uh, explained in the book that they were working on a bunch of lines, <coughs> and there were giants and uh, another <coughs> enemy ward. And possibly this one, Jack Gallant, was one of them. Because there's a bunch of uh, sketches yeah. called a Jack Gallant. There, there was a sub-segment, and, and you know, I would work on them. And uh, people would come to my office, and they'd say, what do you got? i got to go to a meeting. I'm not exaggerating. This is the way it was. I've got to go to a meeting. We need something new. And I would have these things. And I would say, well, try this. See if anybody finds anything in here interesting. And they would run off. The, that's the opposite of good design. That's bad design, but I wanted to keep masters going at all costs. So whatever it took, I did. Um, I believe at this time, one of the toy companies, maybe even Coleco, because this would have been at the time that it was still alive, they had a really cool ring uh, hero. And of course, somebody said, what? Can we tie a ring into it? So there you go. Uh, and all the time, I'm getting a lot of mileage by just doing different kinds of armor 
different kinds of stuff that I can use on He-Man if I need to. But if you think that you sit there and like some kind of guru, you turn out drawings that are kept pristine and they use every bit of it or they respect everything you say or do, that's the opposite of the truth. The truth is you, you do what you can to keep what you know is the best part of it going. Uh, this probably didn't qualify as the best part of it. But I knocked this sketch out probably well, in less than three hours. So I really didn't cost T-Man too much. I, I'm not really answering your question. You have to understand this came out of chaos. It was yeah. like crazy at that time. Well, that's cool. Yeah. I found this interesting because it kind of reminded King Rander, but it was another character for another series. Oh. The, this one, uh, actually, I tried to sell this one uh, as uh, the uh, prelude to He-Man. This was supposed to, originally was going to be He-Man's father. And uh, I don't want to get into the whole backstory, but basically, he was not a very nice guy. And, uh, uh, but he was He-Man's father, and he had, in the original backstory, my story, he had He-Man's mother, and Skeletor's mother fight to the death while He-Man was taken by Man-at-Arms out, out of the king's reach through the poison territory and Skeletor's mother kills He-Man's mother. And then uh, Skeletor and his mother plot against the king and he throws him in the well of souls. So He-Man, I mean uh, Skeletor is mentored by the things that are in the well. That was the original backstory. And this guy was one of the sketches I did for the king. And, uh, hey, again. I'll put down the question of the main guy from the other line. Yeah. So a sword, a magic sword, the team was recording at that point. I think, I, I think that sword is the first time I really detailed what the uh, what I thought the, the sword should became a sword of attorney, right? I I don't know. I don't know. It's, it was still it's still say Jack Gallant, so I don't know how much yeah. got transferred to He Man. If, if I transferred it to He Man and put He Man on there, anybody that came in my office would stop me from working on it and say, weren't you going to do the control drawings for you know Land Ram or something like that? And that's that's it. Uh, she, that's just a babe. That was the first concept for uh, for who I kind of put together as as Evelyn, Tila, and everything. And this was based on a Frank Frazetta drawing I saw that I really loved. And uh, it's done on newsprint with a ballpoint pen. My favorite media. You know, I mean, I love just taking a cheap old ballpoint pen and some newsprint that's got newsprint underneath it and just sketching real lightly and uh, gradually nailing it better and better as you go along. Uh, what she's writing was just, I thought it was just a good beast that, you know, and at that time I was very into um, the empowerment of writing a big mean beast. I, I think I looked at a lot of Frazetta drawings where he's got people riding lizards and riding horses that, my God, they weigh three tons minimum. But uh, it just seems to me if somebody's bad enough to write something like that, you gotta kinda watch yourself. I mean, they're not gonna be a sissy. Even though she's certainly a baby. The hairstyle, like, I, I, I don't know. Uh, this was, this was actually, God, it was done so long ago. This was actually my first opinion. I, I was telling somebody, I was fascinated by Vikings, some of your ancestors, I think. I was fascinated by Neanderthals, some of all of our ancestors. I was fascinated very much by, by uh, the whole um, Gothic period, you know, which everybody is, because they had such neat weapons and stuff. And uh, then I was also fascinated by uh, a guy fighting somebody that way. See the way he's fighting? He's basically just got a shield, a sword, and not much on. And this thing's coming out, it's got nails, it's got, it's, you don't know how long it is, it could go on forever. There's a moment there 
when if I was capable, you'd sure like me to tell you what happened next, right? right. Isn't that true? Isn't that what it's really all about? Don't you want to know what happened next? I mean, you kind of know this guy's going to win, but you're not real sure. And so you want to know what happened next. Well, that isn't, that's the key to doing really great toys, doing a really great book, doing anything is to get the people to say, yeah, but what happened right after that? Then you go ahead and proceed to do that or give them some kind of solution. If they're not saying, you know, Harry Potter was all about that. It was like nothing more than a serial. And you'd say, well, what happened next? You know, does he kill Voltorn? Did Voltorn kill him? You know, what happened? So this was basically my attempt to um, express that and keep that going inside of me. Mattel didn't see this when I did it. They saw it much afterwards. It was used to part of the, the presentation, I think. No, it wasn't. This was never presented because it had the wrong name on it. They would never do it. So this was never presented at Mattel. People came in, looked at it, they liked it, and they would say stuff like, you know, why don't you do something more like this or something more like that? But I think you can see the early early, early pinnings of, of He-Man starting to happen uh, in this drawing. But I did lots of these kinds of things. I used to have sketchbooks. Uh, my wife can tell you, we've kind of stored this, this high uh, full of uh, not only this stuff, but the work that I would like that somebody up like Frank Frazetta or Jerry Jones, Jeffrey Jones, or somebody like that would do. Uh, I loved heavy metal. Do you know metal if you want? Heavy metal? Oh, man. Uh, Mobius, people like that on uh, that magazine. Love their work. Uh, I, I subscribed to the magazine, uh, you know, and uh, to me, that, that was the best art book out there. It was better than anything that they would put out that how to draw people, how to draw animals. To me, heavy metal had everything in it. I loved it. And it sure messed with your head. It was good about that too. I don't know if any of you have ever read that magazine or seen it. Uh, I think it's owned by Kevin Eastman now. You know, he was one of the guys, one of the owners of the Turtles. So after he bought it, to be honest with you, it kind of went downhill. Yeah, yeah, well, all, my, all comic magazines went downhill. That's what Peter Laird says. He said a, a big, a big quota on comic books now is 50,000 units, and 50,000 units is nothing. You're not, believe me. That's if you, if you're whatever you're putting out there, if it doesn't do 50,000 units, unless it's uh, selling for 50,000 dollars, you don't want to do it. It is an interesting one, Mark, because it says many times. But it's yet for another line called it Robin and the Space Suits. You know, what can I tell you? Uh, it was for Man of Arms. It, yeah, it, he, he, is, he has some recognizable helmets. Yeah, sure. See the helmet? Uh, really, the helmet for Man of Arms was a conquistador. That was the. Everything has its roots somewhere, you know? And I always liked their helmets with the big comb on the top and with the space guard coming around here. And so, uh, Man of Arms uh, basically came from this, and I think there's more elements than just that in it. Um, I, I'm sure that this was the beginning of Man at Arms. And Emiliano, he knows, you know exactly where things wound up, but I have to tell you, I know. I, I kind of, like, I try to, to understand the chronology. That, that's the, I saw the date, and the name, and the series, and I said, okay, Maybe you were working on multiple lines at that time. Yeah, I, right. yeah, oh yeah. So a character, Matt Arm was created mainly for this line, and you decided to use it for, for Hina. That's what I, I guess. always was working on multiple lines, both at Mattel, Playmates, Tommy. Uh, uh, frankly, I, I don't know how, you, how many of you guys are drawers or not. I was basically a drawer, but I would get bored if I would wait for their assignments. You know, they'd have me working on Barbie, and I would do what they asked in Barbie in about an hour and a half. And then somebody would take it, and they would take it to a meeting, and they would talk to me again for about two, three days. Well, you know, I'm sitting there, and I've got all these drawing tools, and I'm used to working with my wife. And so I'm used to working like hard all day, but it wasn't really work, it was just what I did. So I would start drawing, and I would, I, eventually I said to myself, why not draw the stuff that you've been working on for so long? This is your chance. And that's, I start pulling out the He-Man drawings. 
Well, you know, you know this guy. <laughs> but this was the. What is it? <laughs> it's a B sheet that you have. Yeah, it's a B sheet. Do uh, you know what a B sheet is? Anybody here know what a B sheet is? A B sheet is a size of. It shows you how the toy industry is so weird. The B sheet is a size of engineering drawing. They have A, B, C, D, and E. And they're different sizes, different proportions. You know, like the letter and legal, same. B was a certain size. A long time ago, the engineers would make the designers actually do their drawing on a B size sheet. And the engineers would tell the designers, because in those days, the engineers told the designers what to do. And they would say, do this drawing on a B sheet. They want to do it on a B size sheet. But later that became just the way you would present it. And everybody got in the habit of calling it a B sheet, and they kept calling it a B sheet, when of course it was no longer proportion to be a B sheet. It could be little things, big things, whatever, it didn't matter. But what they were really saying is, visualize it for me. Give me some evidence so I can see where to start doing my engineering, find out where the, where the uh, joints would go, what kind of joints they would be, and stuff like that. So that it was the designer's job to give them the style and the look and the potential to start getting involved in the engineering. And you had to get the engineering involved early on, and this is where Ted Mayer came in very much. You had to get it going early on, otherwise you'd design something that literally couldn't be made. Or if it was made, it'd be stupid. It'd be all clumsy, real thick walls, things that would look, make, not make any sense. So, like, you would get the thing going, and you'd give the engineer enough information so he could go off and pretend to be working real hard, and you could go on with the line. And that, excuse me, but that's the way I saw it. Now, the engineers wouldn't agree, but that's the way I saw it. You wanted to get them going and keep them moving, because if you didn't, then when you did need them, they would be busy working on Barbie's van or something. And you know this guy. You know this guy. It's my favorite guy. Because without Skeletor, no sense having He-Man. You need them both. And they both have to believe in their cause equally. Skeletor has to believe he's right just as much as He-Man has to believe he's right. Now maybe the difference is Skeletor, as I said before, he doesn't play by any rules. He'll do anything. He-Man, he's got a certain kind of set of morals or rules that he won't go into. In the beginning, He-Man used no magic. He used nothing. That's why he couldn't get real close with Tila, because she did. But look at Man-at-Arms. He basically used the weapons and stuff that he got out of the forbidden territory, you know, that would be guns and stuff like that. Uh, Beast Man, he basically would just bust your face. Um, Tila, she kind of played both sides, as far as I was concerned. She kind of could use magic and she wasn't to be messed with too much because she'd mess you up pretty bad. Then they, Tila morphed. There was a very ambitious marketing lady there who ran Barbie and when they found out how good Tila was testing, all of a sudden we started getting Princess of Power, we started getting all the things that were the girl's side of He-Man. And they sold them. They sold very well. Helped keep Barbie alive for a while. This, this is not the right Skeletor. This is interesting. This is the first Skeletor we had, actually. And this is a really unusual thing uh, for Emiliano to own here. You just, you gave it. Yeah, yeah, it's all yours. <laughs> and uh, this was the one we showed to the little kids, the little boys. And when we showed it to them, as many of the little boys like Skeletor as like He-Man. It was perfect. The little kids grabbed him and picked him up, they knew exactly. They make voices, you know. You know, you win with the little boys. Like, I'm a Skeletor. You know? They're doing it like this lady did before me. It's much better at it. But they actually make the noises. Then they make the noises of battle. Then they try to steal them. And I can say that everybody, everybody goes, they did. And I, you can ask my wife after the meeting if you want. They did. They would try to say, well, you know, you got a winner. I asked Emiliano. He's an old toy guy. 
If you've got kids trying to steal your toys when they know, geez, they'd come over to the, the, the uh, mirror that we were sitting behind, a uh, two-way mirror, and they would actually put their, their tongues on the mirror to make faces, you know, because they knew we were sitting back there. I mean, here's a big mirror, the entire length of a room, about, oh, four foot high. Gee, well, look, I wonder what's going on behind it. They knew immediately. They would come in and they would do this whole performance for us. And it was, you know, pulling out their ears, you know, doing what boys do. And uh, so they knew we were there, but they would still try to steal them. And the facilitator would go in and they would actually say, I know you've got those figures in your jacket. They'd have them in their little bomber jackets and stuff, you know. And the kids would say, no. I mean, I saw this happen over and over again. I don't have anything. What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, the future, the future of our country was learning to perjure themselves. And uh, they would say, well, we'll give you a whole set of Hot Wheels. And the kid would say, no, it's okay. I don't have anything. Give me the Hot Wheels. If you want, but I don't have anything. So finally, they'd have, actually, they actually had to pat them down. It was so cute. I always wished I could have had the, the film of that show it to them later. But the facility would pat them down and pull out a He-Man and pull out a Battle Cat and another one of you. Because one would see the other one cop it. And he would just do, then he would say, you're getting it, I'm getting it, you know, and they would start stealing stuff. Well, I was delighted. And I, as I say in the pre preamble that I wrote for Emiliano, it was the happiest day outside of when I got married of my life because I got to go back and tell my friends, Tony Guerrero and Ted Mayer, that the kids had gone crazy over it. And you know what? There's nothing as great as that. That's... I, I don't know about you, but I walked on the ceiling. I was so delighted. I knew then that I'd have some fun for the next couple of years, and I did. And this, this was Tony's uh, sculpt, as long done, done by Tony, right? Uh, yeah. And the head is out of proportion because we knew we were going to have to make it out of uh, polyvinyl, unlike plastic. So you've got a shrink problem. And the, the people that made it for us, uh, Tony's boss, the head of sculpting, he made him sculpt it too big because he was trying to get the shrink factor, I, I'll explain this a little better, the shrink factor built into the prototype so Tony wouldn't have to sculpt it again. Tony would have sculpted it a hundred times, he didn't care. But Aldo, his boss, made him sculpt it too big so that it would shrink uh, like polyvinyl does, much more than um, than the regular ABS. Uh, those are types of plastic. And one shrinks a lot that you make the head out of, but it's very soft and it takes it takes the kind of paint that they put on it beautifully. Gives you good detail, good texture, but it'll take the paint and you can paint it really well. And the reason I made it, I called out polyvinyl for this, is very simple. Mattel had never done a figure this size before. And everything that every head they'd ever done on Barbie and every doll was polyvinyl. So I knew that if I forced them into a situation of doing ABS plastic or some other type of plastic, that they would, it would meet resistance because they'd never done anything like that. So it took me about 10 minutes to say, when they wanted me to do the material call out, I called out polyvinyl because they already knew how to do it. That's really why I did it. Later on, I was thinking that I could root real hair in it, like a, a ponytail or even snakes or whatever I wanted, because you can do that with polyvinyl. But you can't do it with uh, uh, ABS plastic. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a little bit technical, but does anybody want to ask a question about that junk? But basically, that's the conditions under which you, you do this stuff. And I know Emiliano knows immediately, because we've already talked about it. But uh, actually, Tony could have sculpted this head perfectly, and we could have got away with it if we were working for Hasbro, but we weren't, and we knew it, and so we did it to what Mattel could build. Yeah, what can I say? I like drawing girls. <laughs> it was the basic body of Tila yeah. and Sorceress was supposed to be that one. He's right. Yeah. So it was, they were much like the classics that were going to do just one body with, uh, with different heads and different harness. The decoration that ended up on Tila, so th this was the basic body with Tila's head. 
Then, this part, all the decoration on the breast and on, on, on the hips, etc., was supposed to be a piece of armor that you put on top of Tila, like sorcerer's helmet. So, that was the real plan for, for them. And then, we just got one figure, and all this stuff was sculpted on Tila, instead of being a real A lot of people don't know this, but when we first came out with the first eight figures, I think it was eight figures, Tila sold uh, number four. There was He-Man, Skeletor, there was, um, of course, the Battle Cat really was an uh, accessory, but there was, uh, I think it was, no, it was Tila was third, Battle Cat, I mean, Battle Cat was third, and uh, Tila was fourth. She's way up there. And um, the little boys, in every test, they would steal Tila right away. Right away. But the moms didn't like it. And they would voice their objections to the marketing people. They would say, I don't want my little boy playing with this kind of stuff. This is obscene. This is, you know, pornographic. <laughs> uh, but it wasn't as pornographic as Tony would have made it, believe me. But, you know, they, they, uh, they seemed to have a problem with it. And uh, that was the big thing. Well, there was a very ambitious young uh, marketing lady at Mattel. And when she realized that that many boys were testing so positive for Tila, that she decided to move it over to guess where? Come on, come on, you guys, get with me on this. Guess where Tila was destined to go? You got a Barbie marketing girl, and she's very ambitious, and she's at Mattel, and a female male action figure that females always sold at the bottom is doing really well in testing. Guess what if you're a very, very ambitious marketing person? Guess where you move Tila to? Come on. Barbie. You all know Barbie. There you go. She made, she made her, her spurs by basically moving Tila to Barbie and became Prince of Power and all those other things. And uh, which, by the way, let's face it, they had the resources and the capability of taking it and running with it. I thought they could have made her just a little bit more how do you say it politely, uh, butt kicking? Uh, but, uh, you know, because Barbie all of a sudden was, you know, the, after they got it, she was casting spells and doing these things that you really don't have anything to do with bashing somebody with a big axe, you know, but it's okay. I think I have all the passages, so the, the other version. I love doing this. I, you know, when I got the idea of the Cobra headdress, I went back to my office. I, it just, it's funny, I just got it, and I just went back to my office and I drew it up real fast, and I loved it. Then I didn't want to give up on the idea of her being a bad, bad person. No, I'm trying to interrupt it. And that's sorceress. Yeah. So she, she was actually green in this design. But it was an outfit, because the, the head is flesh. It's just regular skin. So yep. she wasn't supposed to have green skin. No, no, she's, she's wearing like tights. Because they wouldn't do new no tooling for her. So all we, you know, but I can mold her in that color. But, uh, so I thought it was gonna happen. I was sure it was gonna happen because the thing was testing so well. And I thought, geez, maybe we'll have a whole army of Amazons that will go against He-Man and his buddies. Uh, you know, or he can get them on their, his side and they'll go get Skeletor. So I was really enjoying the female figures at this time, and then they dropped, dropped the hammer and they said, now the Barbie people can do it better. Maybe they could. Peace, man. Uh, did this guy go when you were planning to reuse Big Jim Gorilla body? Remember the Big Jim Gorilla? We, 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 no, we didn't. No, we, what, what I did is I did a bear with the same kind of shoulder arm yeah, on. Yeah. I did a bear, and because I just like bears. You know, our ancestors used to fight cave bears in caves, because the bears like to live in the caves, and we like to live in the caves. And so we would fight with these bears. Now, these weren't just little bears. They were the size bigger than Kodiak bears. They were, they were the size bigger than polar bears. They've got the skills of these things, and they're enormous. And you know, our ancestors would fight those with little pointy sticks and rocks. You know, I mean, I, I can't imagine that. If you've ever seen an animal, you know, even in a cage, 
and the size and with the velocity, and animals don't move like we do. When animals move, they have purpose of movement. They move much faster and more capable than we ever dreamed of. I mean, we, they must have wiped out how many thousands of cavemen before they finally figured out it was better just to move somewhere else because these guys were nasty. So I want to do the bear. I did the bear, and he's probably got a, I know he's got a drawing of it. Yeah, I they took they it. They know that drawing. It's three fans, what they call now the red beast was based on uh, the prototype for, for a bear for Big Jim too. Yeah, but the trouble with the bear was it was too much like the Wookiee. And they were all afraid of Star Wars, because it Star Wars kicked butt. So they were afraid of Star Wars, so what they did is they said, you gotta come up with something else. How long do I have with the way things are moving? I got like hours. So I, I remember I went home and I thought about it, thought about it, and kids always like gorillas. I mean, there's King Kong, there's all these different gorillas. Kids are always fascinated by gorillas. I like gorillas, so I thought, why not do Beastman? It's basically a gorilla. Beastman was never supposed to talk. Never, never supposed to say a word. So I hate to be the spoiler of all this fun. Again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Get off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> 